for joining us for the November meeting of the Indiana Commission to Combat Drug Abuse. Uh, we have a full agenda, so we'll go ahead and get started. The minutes were distributed to the members prior to the meeting. Uh, may I have a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 The minutes for the August meeting have been approved. Uh, I've spent the last several months traveling the state and meeting and uh, listening to Hoosiers who are leading the charge against the drug epidemic in their own communities. And among the things they've shared with me is that there's a common thread between uh, each group. And it's a word that appears on the agenda today, and that's team. Although, uh, as we thought about what would be most beneficial for the commission to hear today, uh, I kept coming back to the concept of teamwork and collaboration. And whether naturally or through state-organized initiatives, uh, these individuals and groups in some shape or form are working together toward this common cause uh, that's keeping people alive and help people uh, recover from addiction. Over the last four years, we've worked to build a statewide infrastructure that connects Hoosiers to the full continuum of care, that cares for the whole patient throughout their lifelong recovery journey. Throughout this morning, you'll hear from individuals who make up critical pieces of the continuum in their own communities. They'll share with you how they're combining the knowledge of the skills of EMS, law enforcement, peer recovery coaches, healthcare providers, and are doing their best to determine the course of care for patients and provide them with wraparound services. You'll hear how our overdose fatality review teams are using death cases to inform overdose prevention strategies, and learn about new initiatives help to intend to meet Hoosiers where they're at through street outreach teams approach. Now I'd like to introduce you to someone who plays a critical role in her client's recovery team. Yvette Markey is the founder of InTouch Outreach Resource Center and works as a recovery support coordinator with the Indiana Recovery Network. She serves as a certified addiction peer recovery coach, level two, with a mental health endorsement from the Indiana Issue Issues Coalition. This morning, Yvette will share with us how she's using her unique recovery experience to walk alongside other individuals in recovery. Welcome, Yvette. Thank you, Doug. Thank you for that introduction. Good morning, everybody. Um, as Doug said, I am Yvette Markey. Um, I am happy to be here. I am a lady in long-term recovery. Uh, 20 years in February, my, my children reminded me, Mom, you've been saying 19 years for like a long time. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, well, let me think. So in February, it was actually 20 years. Um, um, substance of choice was crack cocaine um, and alcohol. Um, so substance use um, disorder and also mental health uh, disorders, post-traumatic stress and anxiety, which I managed today fairly well. Um, but before that, I was just a girl, just a little girl. Um, I grew up in public housing, northeast side of Indianapolis. Um, in poverty. Um, I didn't know I was poor until a, a little Caucasian boy that I went to school with called me that one day and like literally teased me and I just didn't even know what the word meant. I don't know if I'd even heard it before. I was about five. Um, he lived across the street. The way the, the uh, projects, what they're called, was made, there was a main road, 30th Street. On this side, there were single individual family homes. And over on this side, there was the complex that we lived in. Um, and yet, we went, we went to school together. And apparently, that was the thing. The poor people lived over here, and people that weren't poor lived over here. So I, you know, that was eye-opening for me. I was like, wow. So then I started to just, I think it goes way back to that. I, I, can, I can trace back um, starting to look at different disparities like in, and actually seeing that, well, I guess we are a little different, but not really. You know, as far as I was concerned, I didn't have any needs or wants. I was warm, I was closed, I was love, you know. But um, so leading up, and we'll, I'll keep this, try to keep these bullets that Miss Shelby was so kind to do for me, because I thought I can't do that in five minutes. I can't <laughs> tell the story in five minutes. Um, so I grew up around um, a lot of alcohol use. Um, you know, and it, my grandparents and aunts, uncles, my mom, single mom, you know, that's what they did for fun. Everybody got together, drank, cooked a lot of food, had a lot of fun. 
Well, my cousin and I decided we'd start sneaking drinks when, they, when they, they're happy and they're dancing and not looking. That was about 12, 12 years old. Um, so we, of course, that we got, we got, uh, what's the word? I can't, I won't use that here, but we, we got ratted out. They, they found us out, okay? And at that point, we're, we're good as, as used to having alcohol. We love it, we want it, we, we want to drink it because we want to be happy. That makes us feel, you know, happy. And I say us, that's my cousin. He's, he's passed away from cirrhosis of the liver, actually alcohol addiction. Uh, several years ago, but you know, so at 13, 14, we found ourselves going and get a cop, what you call someone a cop from you, for you at the, at the liquor store. Somebody that's old enough to go in, you give them a couple of dollars and they'll buy it for you. So uh, fast forward five years or so, I have uh, my oldest daughter, I have four. I was 17 years old in an abusive relationship but I, you know, I survived a, a brutal uh, stabbing in that in that domestic incident, and so, needless to say, that you know that that ended fairly quickly. Um, I met my husband. We were we were, you know, young and in love, and 19 years old, and trying to figure it out. And the opportunity that we thought was the best for us at the time was to sell crack cocaine. So that's how the unfortunate spiral started for me. Um, there was a lady who normally tested the drugs for us, could tell if it's, we should buy it or not from the dealer, if it's the good stuff or if it isn't. And she was in jail. My husband was in jail. So shoot, the man's here, I gotta, we, we, we need to know if we can buy it, so what do I do? I, I, I can do it, you know, I've seen it done. I, I've, I've cooked it up, you know, I've done it. That took, about eight years off my life, just in that moment, and, and fell into addiction, just like that. Um, so, you know, I, I, I was in active addiction for four and a half years. But, you know, when I, when I decided that, you know, this wasn't the life that I wanted for my girls to see, um, I started to, to, to consider you know, not to mention I have picked up a criminal record by now because I'll, I'll sell something, but I'm not gonna sell me. That's the mentality I had just to justify. So I, I, I have theft on my record as a result. Um, yeah, so. Where the, where the ball dropped is my daughter coming in. Um, when I didn't realize that she had to have that school. Um, you know, full blown having a session, as you call it. You know, just me. But it was the third time that I had promised that I was going to quit. with every intention of quitting. You know, stress happened and, you know, so she came in and she, you know, it's a look I can't describe, it's a look I hope I ever, never see again. She said, I hate you, and slammed the door, you know, and it was like the jail cells slamming again, and, you know, just the thought of, if I stayed on that path, I would hear the jail cell sound again, and I wouldn't be able to fix the door slamming. That just happened for the relationship with my daughter. So, you know, I, the high was gone just as quick as it came, it was, it was gone. And I didn't, I didn't pick up a crack pipe, and I haven't since. And it wasn't easy. Um, I did a lot of praying and finding space just for me in the house, in just a small little house, but I took the time to, as much as time as I could take and stay behind that bedroom door and, and get high at the same time, and I just prayed and read my Bible. 
So my journey is a little different. I never went to a program. You know, I, I did that, I prayed, and I poured it to my children. Um, and I allowed them and my husband to pour into me um, when he made it back home. And so, you know, that was the beginning of, of getting me where I am now. Um, you know, I have, I founded an organization. I went on to go to college. Um, Got my associates uh, applied science, direct support for, at Ivy Tech, and then went on to Indiana Wesleyan. Um, and you know, in that time, I realized that so many other people were, some of, even my friends, you know, were still in the space that I was coming out of, you know. And I, you know, a, a really good girlfriend of mine had got beat up really bad, uh, pistol whip for, um, she, she was uh, hustling with the man and decided she would take his drugs while he was asleep. And she was beat nearly to death. And, you know, in that time that I was in, in school and trying to, in early recovery and trying to make sense of it all, and what am I supposed to be doing with this now that I'm, you know, I, I just, couldn't sit, so I said, you know, when I was sitting, I said, I need to try to get in touch with, and we'll call her D. Try to get in touch with D. I need to reach out and see if somebody knows where she's at so I can try to help her. So in that moment, I said, in touch, outreach. And that was the day that the name was born for what I didn't know would become my 501c3 and allow me to do the things that I do, um, you know. And that was just at surface level. I had no idea what God was doing and unfolding and allowed me to get training and, you know, be, have these little alphabets behind my name, as I call them, because the most important to me is the lived experience. Like, I don't downplay or take anything away from the hard work that I did to get those credentials. But, you know, the lived experience got me to, to where I, I, knew, I knew what I needed to do to bring it back and help others. So, you know, I, you know, so, you know, I just, I just uh, started living the life that I knew I wanted to live, and just demonstrating um, that that life is possible. Recovery is absolutely possible. It is absolutely not easy, but it's absolutely easier when you have people to support you and not shame you and not judge you, uh, you know, and sometimes that comes from those closest to you. You know, our families, we, we expect to support, and a lot of, oftentimes it's the opposite. So uh, for me, the street outreach and, you know, meeting people right where they are is just that, like not going with any expectation, but just, just to listen and, and try to, walk with them through it and if you if you if you have some experience with it it makes it just a little easier but it doesn't make it feel any better when you see people hurting and struggling you know so you know I do this work every day with grace and just you know just with the hope that our programming keeps coming and keeps growing and that it'll trickle down to us that are on the streets, you know, and, and that we'll be able to, to do more, you know, because the, the need is growing every day. The numbers is what we see. We got to know and understand it's a lot of people that are unseen that are not counted. And so, you know, I just, you know, I, I appreciate you all being here and, and listening, and I hope that. I'm able to help uh, somebody understand the importance of keeping our programs in place and, and adding on to them like it's everything. Well, thank you so much for telling your story. We really yeah. appreciate it.
As I uh, shared at our August commission meeting, uh, Indiana reported a 33% increase in fatal overdoses in 2020, uh, according to provisional data from the CDC that was released last July. And that number continues to rise as 2021 provisional data becomes available. Uh, the need for life-saving interventions is more important and more present than ever, uh, which is why today I'm excited to announce a $1.7 million investment in 10, 10 harm reduction street outreach teams across our state. These outreach teams are strategically placed in communities with high rates of overdose and will provide harm reduction strategies and resources such as naloxone to individuals at high risk of overdose. We know naloxone saves lives and with the added power of human connection, these teams will be a lifeline for Hoosiers with substance use disorder. We've invited Maddie Alton with the Division of Mental Health and Addiction to give a brief overview of harm reduction and, and what is expected of the outreach teams once they're on the ground. Maddie? Thank you, Doug. Good morning. Um, like Doug mentioned, my name is Maddie Alton. I'm actually a database analyst for our state opioid response grant with the Division of Mental Health and Addiction. Um, and there's my contact information if you'd like to reach out. So I recently started this position a few months ago, and my supervisor, Becky, reached out and said, you know, what are your interests in this role? And I said, anything with harm reduction. That is my, like, I need to work in harm reduction. And so these initial conversations led to our harm reduction street outreach teams. To give a little bit of background, and Doug touched on this, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has significantly affected the number of overdose deaths in our state. There's been a 33% increase in fatal overdoses in 2020, according to the provisional data um, released by the, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. As Doug mentioned too, this is not surprising considering the common phrase in the recovery community, the opposite of addiction is not sobriety, but human connection. We know that throughout the pandemic, this connection and key link to recovery and wellness uh, was taken away from many individuals. Despite these circumstances, providers across the state use their resources and ingenuity to try to mitigate this barrier. But we know that not everybody is ready for sobriety or treatment, and this is where harm reduction is critical. Harm reduction meets people where they are, but does not leave them there. Or one of my favorite quotes, uh, harm reduction is like unconditional love for people struggling with addiction. Put simply, the goal of the, these teams is to keep people alive. So what is harm reduction? Harm reduction can include naloxone, connection to medication for opioid use disorder, referral for treatment, housing, employment, peer support, and community connection, all of this coming without judgment. Harm reduction is not simply treatment. So as Becky and I were discussing ways in which we could apply harm reduction strategies in our community, we met with a group that was already doing some street outreach, um, and they carried naloxone and referral information with them. This guided the framework for our harm reduction street outreach teams. With funds from SAMHSA, through their prevention and treatment block grant for COVID-19 relief, this seemed like the perfect call to action given the direct impact COVID has had on our communities. So from there, we sent out a request for proposals with funds to support up to 10 teams across the state. We requested that agencies who applied had knowledge of areas in their community where illicit drug use was high, a connection through harm reduction services, homeless services, recovery or substance use services, a strong understanding of harm reduction principles, and the ability to staff a team of two outreach workers and a supervisor. We really didn't know how many teams would apply, um, but we wanted to make sure that this opportunity was accessible uh, to people who may not typically contract with our team. So we held a virtual Q&A session prior to the application deadline, and we had a good turnout. Um, but overall, we had 25 proposals submitted for this project, with nearly 90% of those applicants not being current vendors with DMHA. So that was pretty cool. Uh, and this effort has been greatly supported by the Indiana Department of Health, particularly their harm reduction program manager, as well as the Office of the Governor. Um, and we've also been fortunate to collaborate with other teams, such as Lauren, who will be presenting later today, 
on the overdose fatality review teams, um, and she can provide some community context in areas where these teams will be working. So with that, we're excited to announce the 10 teams that have been selected for funding uh, across the state. Um, and I do want to point out, I know that might look a little small on the screen, but this is a heat map of um, drug-related deaths across the state. So the darker colors indicate a higher rate of drug-related deaths. Um, this is also data from 2019. So we can infer that based on the increase in overdoses, uh, the need is even greater in these areas today. I'll go back to that slide in a minute. Um, but there are a couple requirements for the teams. So they'll be doing weekly street outreach. Um, they'll be making the harm reduction kits. They'll have to do supervision and debriefing after they do shifts working street outreach. Um, there will be a little bit of data collection, but uh, something that I think Yvette touched on is we do require that they have a minimum of 30 minutes of self-care for their staff every week because this is really challenging work. Um, each team, before they get started, will attend a DMHA-approved harm reduction training, um, and then we have some consultants that will provide ongoing technical assistance throughout the project. So, if teams are in the field and they have a question, they can reach out to these folks. Um, we also have an evaluation team we'll be working with, and they'll be facilitating bi-monthly learning meetings. Um, and this is a place where we can talk about barriers, um, successes, and even specific cases. Um, with that, um, this is a 24-month contract starting November 1st. Um, we'll hold our first training next week. And street outreach will hopefully begin January 1st, which we know is a particularly challenging time for our houseless community members. As we talked with agencies who we did not select for funding, we realized that there was a clear interest in learning more about harm reduction across the state. Um, so we're discussing potential opportunities to expand resources um, related to harm reduction. So we're really excited, and I can switch back to this slide that shows the teams that we selected for this year. Any questions for Maddie? Yeah. Hi, Maddie. Chris Box. I know you're working with the Department of Health. Doug and I were just discussing that. Are you guys discussing how to get people access to infectious disease testing as you're doing the harm reduction also? Yeah, that's a great question. And we were meeting with them yesterday, and they really bring that disease prevention um, lens that maybe our team doesn't always approach harm reduction from. Um, so that's going to be a continuing conversation, but great point. Thank you. Hi, nice job. Thank you very much for sharing that. I have a quick question. Uh, will all 10 of these teams cover all 92 counties, or are there gaps in the state when it comes to harm reduction, or how does this look like in terms of the state map? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, they'll be covering the counties that are up here. So most of them are covering one up to three counties. Um, but since it's such a small team and they'll be doing limited, a limited number of outreach hours per week, um, it's probably not feasible to cover all counties across the, the state, um, but we're, we're trying to look for some additional funding to maybe expand. There are also fixed harm reduction teams and um, syringe service program sites around the state too. So we need to kind of cross these two maps and look and see where those gaps are, especially related to your overdose death rate. Thanks, Dr. Box. Thanks. Dr. Box covered just what I was going to ask. I wondered, um, I'm sure this work is limited by funding, but were there counties at the end of the day that because of the heat map there were a lot of lives lost and you wished you could help those counties but you weren't able to for lack of funding? Do you have that kind of uh, list and a plan on how to approach to help those counties? Yeah, so one of the things that we did was we offered to meet with all of the folks that weren't awarded the funding. Um, just so we could get a better sense of their interest in the project. And it was pretty competitive because we had 25 proposals. We could select less than half. Um, but we did offer to meet with them. We also got some feedback on what kind of support they would like moving forward related to harm reduction. So I think we're going to do maybe some sort of workshop where we can, in partnership with the Department of Health, um, offer some additional maybe training um, or continuing education. Senator Yoder. Thank you, Maddie. I, I don't have a microphone. Mm -hmm. 
matters. But um, I was curious about the 1.7 million. Is that right? Did I have that in my mind? I thought may, I, maybe we hear what we want to hear. I thought maybe you said billion, and I thought <laughs> <you'd> probably <laughs> check. I wish. Um, I know. So 1.7 million. Can you speak to how those dollars are divided in the 10? I mean, just briefly. Yeah. Um, how that was um, decided. And secondly, with harm reduction, what hurdles um, are, are there that continue to be there, how we as a commission continue, can continue to reduce that stigma and promote education? So to answer your first question about the funding, each team has been awarded $140,000, and that is for um, creating the kits with harm reduction materials, as well as um, time for the staff to be doing outreach work. Um, in regard to your second question, I think that we'll continue to find out those barriers as we work with the teams. Um, but we do have some folks who've done street work before, and so I think we're through the training trying to mitigate some of those barriers as much as we can, especially having those people available for ongoing technical assistance. Um, at the state level and, and policy-wise, I think that that's something our team is continuing to discuss. So I, I don't know if I have an answer for you right now, but we're definitely thinking about that. Thank you. Thank you, Mandy. Uh, Mandy, can you talk a little bit about the challenges that you're seeing with uh, the uh, flooding of fentanyl into our state? Because uh, you, know, you reference uh, safe use supplies, but there really isn't any safe use of, of fentanyl. Can you? Talk about the challenges that uh, you're seeing on the ground. Um, I think, trying to formulate an answer for you, what we want with these teams is really to connect with the community, um, with folks that have lived experience doing the work, um, in hopes that they can have that shared experience where they can maybe guide them in the right direction. Um, we are evaluating what supplies are best to put into the kits, and so that is a continued discussion as well. Marcia? Just a question regarding, I appreciate your comment or your quote here about meeting people where they are, and that was one of my takeaways from Yvette's um, discussion this morning. I appreciated that. I'm curious, I know that there are a lot of individuals that I see that are still being charged because they have possession of substances at the time of overdose or they have possession of paraphernalia. What role will these teams play in meeting individuals who may not be necessarily arrested at the time but find themselves in jail after they're released from a hospital uh, because they've been charged? Are these folks uh, going to be going into jails because our sheriffs doing the best they can, but they don't have the resources inside the jails to do some of the services that I think you folks will be providing through this program. So I was just curious whether or not there's going to be any jail-based contact. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. And I think that each team will be doing something very local. So it might be different depending on the county if they want to work with the jail or not. But something that we recently have done is um, we've worked with the naloxone vending machines that will be placed in some jails across the state. Um, so hopefully that is a good resource as well as the Nalox boxes. Um, but I can't speak to whether the teams will or will not be directly working with the jail population. Um, my assumption is that... Yeah, Judge, we have, a, um, we have a program that we've been funding through the Indiana Sheriff's Association uh, that is funding that connection back to the community, uh, that treatment in the jail, and then that connection back, re-entry back in, uh, and that connection with a community mental, mental health provider. Um, but um, these, are, these are really, uh, we know that there's a large number of individuals that we're not reaching, that um, EMS isn't even touching, and that they're not hitting the justice system. So um, this is really an effort to go out and um, find individuals that aren't accessing um, our syringe service programs, aren't, aren't getting you know, any care at all. Um, so this is really trying to reach deeper. Uh, and look at really where our overdoses are taking place and how can we begin to uh, get people out of their homes, um, get, go into some of the homeless camps in some of the areas and really um, find them and provide them the supports that they need. Thank you, Maddie. 
And I also want to thank Yvette, um, because I was thinking about the children that may be out there and homeless, um, potentially victims of human trafficking as well. So are these teams prepared um, to know what to do if they, when they're out there, when they're interacting with potentially children? Yeah, I guess I didn't get into the details of the training, but we'll be discussing safety both for the teams that will be going out as well as safety for the individuals that they'll be serving. Um, and that also extends to, you know, what is in the kits and their safety when they're distributing those items. Um, but I think you do bring up a great point that, that there may be children that are involved in these situations. So um, I'd be interested in discussing that a little further. Yeah, thanks. The unique nature of this RFP is it really goes to meet the needs of the community. So these 10 uh, organizations uh, are doing a wide range of, of services, um, because, and, and not all of them are the same, because not all communities have the same, the same needs. So the, there's a wide range of activities that will be taking place in this. So thank you. Thank you, Maddie. And, and again, I want to thank the Division of Mental Health and Addiction and the Department of Health uh, for making this investment possible. Um, it, you know, the partnership between um, those two agencies uh, has, I think, during COVID has really only grown uh, stronger. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce a group of individuals uh, who are taking another one of our state level, uh, state funded concepts uh, to the next level. Uh, Mimi Gardner, Beth Werbel, uh, Ephatha Malden, and Kara Jones join us today from HealthLink. Uh, they are community mental health center, or they are a community health center uh, in northern Indiana uh, to share how they've developed a mobile integrated response system in their community. Uh, mobile integrated response system, or MERS for short, play a vital role in supporting individuals with substance use disorder and shepherding them toward recovery. Indiana's 10 MERS providers are operating in 24 counties and have provided at least one service to more than 1,700 people in the last year. These systems involve a mobile response team, peer recovery coaches, medication assisted treatment prescriber, connections to emergency departments, a wraparound service provider, and a trauma informed recovery oriented system of care to align all of these services. Between all the players, Hoosiers have access to peer support, clinical interventions, employment support, recovery housing, referrals, and transportation to treatment, food banks, child care, medical clinics, and other necessary services. Uh, Mimi and her team graciously accepted our invitation uh, to talk about why the strong unified network and a culture of collaboration are essential to the success of serving their clients. So thank you for joining us. Thank you, Doug, and thank you committee members for allowing us to present today. First of all, HealthLink is a federally qualified health care center, and we are celebrating our 25 years of service to the community, and community health, work, community, health workers, community health centers are about serving the underserved communities, also about serving um, and addressing health disparities and about equity. So this program was perfect for us to engage in. Our CEO, Beth Robel, is the one, because I hadn't even started with the organization, who agreed to help write the proposal for this program. And so my fourth day of employment, <laughs> here you are, do something with it. <laughs> so anyway, we did something with it. Um, so, um, and this all started with um, MAT services. Um, before I started, Beth had taken over a clinic and had agreed to start, well, the clinic was providing MAT services, so she agreed to take it over, and from that it has expanded into six of our other clinics, and um, we are now fully in, fully invested in addiction services. So what is a mobile integrated response team? It is interdisciplinary. It is cross-system collaboration. It is based on system theory. We are providing services for those who are opiate and stimulant dependent. And our goal is to combat the whole opioid crisis. So we are working with multiple systems throughout communities. And what we do is we work with, on our actual service delivery, we work with EMTs, we work with plain clothes police officers, and then we hire certified peer recovery coaches. We currently have 15 certified peer recovery coaches who provide wraparound services 
for clients in our community. And our approach is very proactive. We are providing paramedicine to the clients in the community. We, we have our EMT worker go out. They are providing a um, cursory medical examination. Because as you know, people who've been addicted, who've been out there on the streets, may not have been to a doctor recently. So this gives us an opportunity to just check them out to see maybe they don't need to come into services right away, but they might need to go into a hospital. So fortunately, we have not had that happen. Um, and we also, um, the police, office, police officers, police departments that we work with through four counties also provide community policing. Their goal is to get out in the community to let them know that these services are available, they are welcoming people and looking at alternative ways to provide services, which does not end in incarceration. But instead, we have officers who have been in recovery themselves. And so they are very happy to work with us and provide the services. And they are able to say, I survived, I am in recovery, you can be in recovery too. Um, as Yvette said, we meet people on the ground where they are. We go into their homes. We go into their communities and we try to help them bridge the gap from an overdose or someone who needs and seeks help to get on the road to recovery. We treat, because we are a FQHC, we treat the whole person. So we're looking at them emotionally, physically, try, we're addressing their social determinants of health. Next slide. Um, so we were established in 2019. As I said, we have 15 peers. We are servicing the counties of Porter, LaPorte, Stark, and Lake. We've received over 754 referrals and 663 unique referrals and 278 enrollments in the program. We are partnering with over 72 organizations, which include law enforcement, judiciary, schools, DCS, hospitals, social service agency, other FQHCs, community mental health centers, churches, parole, probation, probation, community corrections, coroner, and then fire and EMS departments. Next slide, please. The goals of our program, I cannot see this. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm over 50. Anyway, so I take the glasses off. Anyway, um, again, we're about the cross collaboration, cross system work. We are trying, um, we practice harm reduction. We are about getting as many other systems involved. We are about helping any way that we can to address this epidemic, because there's not one way. There has to be multiple ways that you address this, and so you'll see in a few minutes of the other things we're doing. So there's a big piece of this, which is service delivery, but there's also other pieces that we do um, and that we're involved in. So our process is we receive a referral, we can get them from families, individuals, or we get them from police, other social service agencies, the ERs, and then we um, contact the individual, we'll do an intake assessment. At the intake assessment, uh, law enforcement and um, EMS are with us. We provide wraparound services, we will complete a recovery plan, um, we provide Narcan training, so that that way, and we leave that person with a um, box of Narcan just in case something happens when we leave. And um, then we follow up with another appointment with them. We do linkage to community resources. We may link them to detox programs, rehab programs, outpatient, IOP, PHP programs. Next slide. Our services are person-centered. We are able to work with the individual until they decide the treatment ends. So we have people who've been in our program over a year. We've had people who um, we've seen no longer have any involvement with um, pro uh, probation, get off a of parole. We've had people who had DCS involvement who no longer have the involvement. Um, we've had people who have stopped using drugs and have gotten engaged in our community supports um, a lot of them have, because um, we push this strongly, that they attend AA or NA as part of what they do to sustain their recovery. And because our staff are in recovery, it also helps because they take them to meetings. They take them to different community 
events, they take them to treatment. We also provide um, what we call flex funds, which are for social determinants of health. So if somebody has an issue where they need housing and um, they can't pay rent or they're behind in rent, we will provide support for them there. Um, if somebody has been evicted, we're going to help them find another apartment. We work with our township trustees. Um, we work with judges where we had situations in which we had somebody who the judge wanted to lock up because they had not been able to do what they needed to do. Our recovery, peer recovery coaches in court talked to them and the judge who happened to be over township trustee was like, I'll give you a check. And so we were like, we can, but it's going to take a week. He was like, I'll give it to you, just pay me back. So it is a very coordinated service. It's a service that we are able to get a lot of people involved in helping us in the process. And I think that's the beautiful thing about it, because it is community driven. And it's driven in four communities. So next slide. Our collaboration is strong. It's unified networks. Um, we continue to add members as we go. Um, we don't take no for an answer. We get it sometimes, but we just keep on plugging. To, and sometimes we've been able to get people who weren't originally wanting to be involved involved when they see what we do. Um, we build on connections that are already in the communities. We've been able to then develop other um, endeavors that are within what we're doing. So. We have uh, gotten involved in you know, next slide, to opioid fatality review teams, um, TROS, which are trauma-informed recovery-oriented systems of care. And so we are now able to have communities which are trauma-focused, and we're looking at what are the needs in each of these communities and what are the services that need to be provided. We come together. We're developing strategic plans now in each community so that we can develop what the needed services are, examples being recovery homes. We are working very hard to establish recovery homes, look at issues like transportation, look at issues to make sure everything we do crosses a continuum of services. Next slide. As I said, the opioid fatality reviews, we participate in four of them. Um, we have been able to get, with Lauren's help, um, four, it was one established and then um, we've established four. We are able to hear what the needs are. We had a meeting one time with the coroner and um, started in Laporte and he said to us, we need opioid fatality reviews. There's so many suicides and overdoses that are occurring. And so we sat down and said, let's do this. And so we were able to get people involved. We have four going strong. Next slide. Um, and we are now involved in crisis intervention teams. And so our purpose is to develop crisis teams in the community with law enforcement, EMS, and other service providers. So we have four teams going. We've been going about three months. They're going strong. Um, every day we have someone else. Um, wanting to be involved. We're working closely with NAMI, who was funded as, um, through DMHA to get these teams started. So we're very excited that Northwest Indiana is providing strong four communities <laughs> of crisis intervention teams. And we're also working with 9A8 so that we can cross, because um, we're on the same mission. Next slide. Um, we're also involved in community training. What we do is, since we're working with so many different organizations, we make a point of providing on a monthly basis, thank you, COVID, um, to provide services, I mean, to provide a training virtually for social workers, peer recovery coaches, probation officers, law enforcement, DCS workers. And what we do is we have them, we have the people we train turn around and provide presentations. And these are our partners. And so we're able to do, there's just a sampling of some of the trainings that we have done. So, next slide. And what we've learned is multi-system collaboration creates innovative solutions. Sharing data improves your collaboration and breaks silos. Stigma must be addressed in every system. You involve every system. Every system that a person touches needs to be at the table. And we have to educate and train. So 
and we, for, we focus on workforce development. One of the things is that peer recovery coaches, um, we have helped, we've hired 15, but what we do is we help other organizations hire and train individuals themselves. So we work with ICADA, and once a year we provide a free training for anybody who wants to be a peer recovery coach. Um, and um, we believe in the evidence-based model of using peers in the services that we provide. I do want to thank DMHA. They have been very helpful to us and supportive, um, giving us access to some of the experts in the country, giving us access to articles, having us talk to people. Um, we were able to um, have the opportunity to um, experience a a trauma training from National Council, and it was just phenomenal. Every week for, I think it was seven weeks, we were able to have experts in the country provide the training. And so that is a big focus of what we do, is um, making sure our peers are trained in trauma care. We trained all of our social workers in our agency, our CHWs, and so what we're doing is just sensitive to the needs of the clients, because as you know, a good proportion of people who have addiction have suffered from trauma. And so we are making sure that um, our staff are trained. We do a lot in terms of motivational interviewing, brief action planning, so that they are skilled to provide the service. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Ethica Malden. I'm a licensed clinical social worker and licensed clinical addiction counselor. Um, I am a, um, the manager for the mobile integrated response team. So basically what I do, I try to kind of keep my team motivated when they're um, seeking patients who are having a lot of mental health concerns, they will approach it and, you know, ask questions regarding how can they get additional services. Um, and we're seeing that a lot more. So some of the things that I have been able to do um, were basically just to kind of put together like an additional um, service. And we do a stress management um, session with our patients. Many of them have experienced a trauma. And like Mimi mentioned, um, having a trauma-informed um, care plan is really important because we need to know how to approach individuals as we're going into their home and talking with them, you know, through an intake and as well as follow-up appointments, how to approach like their individual concerns. So the mobile integrated response team, you know, like we mentioned, we um, provide peer services to, um, to clients who are suffering from a substance use disorder. And as we do a full wraparound intake, a lot of other concerns start, uh, we are uh, become aware of. Um, such as having depressive um, disorder or symptoms and anxiety, um, and maybe a previous diagnosis of PTSD. Now, those are all concerns that the peer recovery coaches will not touch. Um, they will, like, you know, further, like, you know, staff it with me so we can kind of get, get a game plan. Um, the stress management meeting that I set up is virtual, where the individual, if they have um, a laptop or, or any kind of, like, accessibility to, like, Zoom, we can like meet really quick and the peer recovery coach is also present in the meeting. Um, where we use like the evidence-based procedure of like cognitive behavior therapy, you know, just to kind of get an understanding of just how their thoughts, um, symptoms impact their behaviors. Um, with that, we have had a lot of success. Many individuals, they were really um, impressed that we could offer something just on the spot, like if they had that concern. We try to do it twice a week. If needed, we will increase that. Um, so specifically, the peer recovery coaches, they are able to handle the wraparound intake, they do follow-up appointments, referrals, um, and then, like I mentioned, mental health concerns are, you know, they come up periodically. So one of the benefits of addressing the mental health is, like, again, treating the whole person. We recognize that, like, the majority who are coming into the program, they were impacted by some sort of trauma. So their first need that they're actually getting addressed is, how can I... Um, work through the substance use concerns that I'm having, whether it's an opioid um, use disorder or stimulant use or alcohol, which is basically our top three. Um, they are also wanting help with their additional mental health concerns. Um, some of like the symptoms can include insomnia, loss of interest in activities, um, the feelings of worthlessness, suicidal ideations, excessive worrying, um, or, and or trauma. Now, whenever there is a suicidal ideation, immediately, we drop everything, we'll do an assessment and get that individual, like, you know, to the right, you know, facilities, if that means um, inpatient stay at the, you know, the local ER, um, things of that nature. Um, there was a, um, some, a success story that's come a few months ago 
uh, a peer recovery coach led an intake uh, with a full wraparound approach with an individual uh, who had like a psychotic disorder. So during the intake, they were kind of struggling because a lot of the um, questions that were coming up or the responses to the questions were very delusional um, in nature. So they just didn't know which direction to go. So he called me and, and asked if he, you know, if I can get some assistance and whatnot. So as soon as, like, you know, meeting the individual, recognizing that, you know, she had a, a previous diagnosis of schizophrenia, had no um, um, behavior health treatment in the past, she, we found out during intake that she was also pregnant. She was in her third trimester, and she had no, and also she had a stimulant use disorder. So all of that, just like, you know, one thing affecting the other, um, had no awareness that she needed prenatal care. Um, she was very disconnected with her family. Um, she felt that she could do, like, everything on her own. She didn't realize or didn't have that awareness that there was help available. So we literally, like, everything that Mimi mentioned in her PowerPoint slide, we, that whole team impact, we immediately had to like get a, a group of members together to kind of help this individual. Um, one, with her mental health concerns, we had to get a referral, we're trying to seek residential. We actually contacted her mom to kind of like, you know, see what her mother, we know things that, you know, she could offer as well. Um, we were able to get a delivery team together because she had no plans on delivering because again, we're talking about a delusional mindset of, I don't think I need this. I think I can continue to go, you know, even doubting the fact that she was pregnant. So we were able to get a, a few physicians together to do a um, prenatal um, exam with her. She had never had an ultrasound. So they were able to just pick up all the pieces and just like work with her. Um, and the success part was that she actually, because we were kind of worried that she would not go to the hospital, but her working through her mother she was able to encourage her and explain why this was needed. Um, got her to the hospital and you know had the whole delivery plan. You know, delivered a healthy baby and everything. So that's just like one component of why you know when we're addressing the mental health, trying to connect those needs with family that have been like you know broken, which we see a lot with substance use disorder. So that's like one of the um, uh, important feature. So within a stress management session, it's no cost to the patient. Um, the sessions are provided by a licensed clinical social worker, and we have interns who also um, um, are observing these sessions as well to kind of understand how to use cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, the patients, they learn ways to identify their triggers in life, um, using CBT skills to address it, which is one of our evidence-based procedures. And the patients that participate in stress management sessions, they have learned ways to manage their anger and stress especially during the holidays. So right as we're approaching this holiday season, I'll try to offer a few more because we understand that by nature, that's like you know when a lot of individuals feel more rejected um, with family because they may not have that social support that you know um, the rest of the you know people may have. Um, so whatever needs they're going through, they can just kind of work them out through there. Um, and it's not a, a one size fits all type of like session. We also uh, refer out to uh, individual therapists, like within the community, um, either through home base or you know sending them to a uh, mental health uh, community mental health facility. Um, so studies of like peer recovery support for individuals with substance use disorder, they have demonstrated they improve relationships with providers and social supports. There's increased satisfaction with the treatment experience overall, and there reduced rates of relapse and increase um, retention and treatment. So it is clear that peer support services, they can provide the valuable approach to guiding consumers as they strive to achieve and maintain recovery. And the trauma trainings are important when working with the patients since uh, many have stated they have experienced some kind of physical, emotional, or sexual abuse. Um, so that concludes everything, thank you. Hi, um, my name is Kara Jones. I'm the program evaluation manager with HealthLink, and I just have a few uh, slides of data for you guys just to review what the end cap of our second grant year, um, where we kind of stand in our program services. So in the first two years, um, as Mimi shared earlier, we've had over 750 referrals. Um, and you can see of unique referrals, there's 663. We've seen um, a lot of, of duplicate referrals. Some people even referred three or four times at different distinct episodes. Um, and from different agencies, uh, which I think really shows how the system is connected and we're, we're getting that open door and people are getting directed to services that they need in our counties. Um, 
And then of those referrals, we've had 273 enrollments. Again, you can see we've had some duplicate enrollments of well, as well, where people have fallen out of care and been discharged and then re-engaged in the program later. So overall, our, our conversion rate to enrollment is 36%. Um, we've seen a significant growth, and we continue to grow. Um, from our first grant year to second grant year, we had a 53% referral increase, a 35% enrollment increase. Um, we don't always get a ton of information on those referrals. Um, sometimes it's just a name and a contact. Um, but sometimes it, we'll see notes where, you know, this patient is pregnant or it's from the ER and it's a noted um, previous, like, immediate overdose situation. Um, oh, and I do have, so one in eight were previous referrals. And we're seeing about 55% um, male to female. Our top referral sources are healthcare, um, and actually 33% overall are, are coming from HealthLink, from our providers or our staff. Um, and as Mimi and Apatha both shared, um, I actually see a ton of those HealthLink referrals are coming from our actual peer recovery coaches. Um, they're just meeting people out in the community. They're at these meetings. They're present in um, those circles, and they're bringing in just people, and they're making those referrals themselves um, and getting people engaged in the program. Um, and you can kind of see that breakdown from there. 17% uh, in the criminal justice, 10% were engaged with a couple of different recovery organizations, um, community corrections and probation, and we're also just getting um, some general calls. People are calling in to our general health league number, looking for services, um, family and friends, those types of things. Um, and so our enrollment demographics of those unique clients that have been enrolled um, there's just some basic breakouts there. You can see our, our largest proportion in age group is that 30 to 39 range, just under half there. Um, a little bit more male to female, but it's closer to middle than what you typically see in substance use programs. Usually it's significantly more male. Um, and the race breakout, we're at 78% Caucasian or white, 6% African American, 1% um, American Indian or Alaska Native, and 3% more than one race. We do have some unreported um, data in that field from, I think, more from SOAR 1, and we've um, enhanced our data collection procedures to make sure that all of those things are being captured. Um, and I think Mimi mentioned, but we're also looking to um, enhance services to our minority populations into our next grant year um, and are currently putting together a cultural competency plan for that. Um, and looking at ethnicity, we have about 9% Hispanic and Latino. And just looking at our eligible substance use disorders between opioid and stimulant, we had 51%, so about half for that opioid use disorder, 39 a stimulant use disorder, and about one in five have both. Um, we kind of touched on that we're a federally qualified health center. So um, with that, we're able to provide a really unique lens and engagement into care because we have that healthcare background. Um, so when we look at our Merck clients, over half of them have had clinical encounters at one of our, our health clinics. Um, and you can see that spectrum down from primary care and behavioral health, working with those basics. But you also see people engaged in dental and pharmacy and community health workers and optometry and a midwife. We even have a couple of people that saw a podiatrist. Um, so you can, you can kind of see where, again, we really focus on that whole patient care, really making sure that they're touching all of the bases that they need to. Um, and also of note, of the folks that uh, came in and had primary care clinical visits, uh, about 40% of those were receiving MIT. Um, we also have their peer coaches are now documenting in our uh, electronic health record system, um, which also helps us as we're looking forward in more data collection and evaluation of this program where we can really combine um, and look at that data from a couple of different angles. Um, and lastly, we're just in the process of, of trying to um, download all of our data from the first two years now. Um, we just had our, we're on that fiscal cycle, so we just had our great year end at the end of September here. Um, but when we, when we took just a preliminary look at some of our six month outcomes, we are seeing some of those hallmarks that we're looking for. We're seeing full time employment increasing. We're seeing, um, as Mimi mentioned, some of uh, the parents that had indicated at their intakes that they didn't have custody of their children due at that six month reassessment. Um, we have reported days of committing a crime in the past 30 days is decreasing by a significant amount. 43% um, had reported a decrease in alcohol use days, 24 had reported a decrease in drug use days, and we're seeing over double reported attendance at those self-help groups. Um, so those are some of the initial hallmarks that we're looking at, um, and we'll be looking to do a more um, in-depth evaluation, but 
um, just preliminarily wanted to share some of those pieces. And I think that's all we have for you guys today. Thank you. Questions? Yes. I have two, if that's OK. Uh, my first question, the data slide that you just went over, are you able to hear me OK? Yeah. Um, and I know this is hard, because I think you said you've been doing this work since 2019. Mm -hmm. okay. Were you able to compare, because we've been hearing that overdose deaths are up during the pandemic, right? Are you able to connect deaths in your service areas pre-pandemic to now? I mean, it's probably not statistically proper to do so, but are you able to, to just say, determine whether your program or your services are, is reducing deaths, or are you not able to make that connection at this time? Well, we've had three deaths, and of the three deaths, one was prior to the pandemic, and the other two were during the pandemic. Um, so we know that we, all, we constantly hear about clients in the community who aren't enrolled in our program, and we can see that the overdoses continue. And we just, you know, look for opportunities that we can meet people and, you know, expand the services and let them know what we're doing so that we can get more people involved. Okay, that's a follow-up question. Now I have three, if that's okay. <laughs> that's <fine. laughs> um, yeah. So let's say that you are working with a client, mm -hmm. and then that client becomes incarcerated. Mm -hmm. Do your services cross that threshold? Are yes. you still? Yes. Thank you. We are that. in two jails. Wonderful. We are in four emergency rooms, about to be a fifth emergency room, where the peers actually physically sit in the emergency rooms. And then um, of the two jails, one, we get the clients right when they're about to be discharged, and the other one, um, and start, we actually work with them while they're incarcerated. That's wonderful. Okay. Third question, and yes. I'm just interested in your point of view, if, if you have a, an opinion on this. In Indiana, since, so for 2019, 2020, and 2021, our second highest felony charge is possession of a syringe. And I'm just curious from where you all sit, working on the, being on the ground, working with people directly, do you feel like that is an effective approach for people who are possessing a syringe with an intent to use it for uh, illicit substances? Or do you see models that are different that could be a better approach to working with populations that could be charged with that offense? Well, I can tell you that um, some of our clients, what will happen is that if they have a warrant, per se, um, we've been fortunate that some of our police officers will call on scene when we're doing an intake prosecutor and see if they will allow that person to stay out, out of jail and that they just have to complete our program. So we've been able to come up with solutions right there on the spot, and that has been, I thought, fantastic. Um, because it's not about arresting somebody, it's about getting them the help that they need. So. Other questions? Mm -hmm. Senator Yoder. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for being here. I had a question. Is Merck an example of, I noticed, like the harm reduction grants that went out, you're not one of the, those no. listed, mm -mm. but are you one of the examples uh, that was given that it's, you're still there doing the work, you're getting support, but you're not one of Yeah, those we're not listed. one of the receivers of the mm -hmm. outreach, but we actually work with them. That's right, um, yes. And I think this is, you know, I think that's wonderful. Um, when I lived in Baltimore, we had a big program mm -hmm. with the street outreach whatnot, um, and we see it as, I think, part of the continuum and it allowing us to be able to, we're right there so that if they do find somebody and they need services, all they have to do is call. And we're happy because one of the organizations is one of our partners. Okay, so. thank you. Mm -hmm. So can I add something to this? I think part of this is that as a community health center, and I think IDOH, I wanna thank Dr. Box, because. That's how we got started. I've been doing this for 20 years, and you made a comment about the two organizations working together. I have never in my 20 years, I would say the last three years, seen this. I mean, we've worked together on a, how long did we do the integrated care? It was a long time. Okay, but I think it was the, the core. And being, so what we are able to do is we take the federal, we take the state, and whether it's on the medical side, or, you know, the healthcare side or the mental health, 
we pull it all together. And the last time I looked, we had a neck in the body. And I think that's where we've gotten in trouble. People forget um, when, and, and I'm sure everyone struggles with trying to get health care. Do I go over here? Do I go there? Do I do there? This group pulls that all together. And you asked about, you know, Saturday morning I got a, a call from um, Mayor Dermody and um, asking me for help. You know, we're there, we're taking stress off our own providers, the ER, because otherwise they would have, you know, they're gonna turn them back because they don't know what to do. And then we have the police force, and, and we do have one prosecutor that says the more data we can give them, the, that he's starting to really love this. So when we do this as a group, like you guys are doing at the state level, these are the things that can happen. Okay, I'm off my soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So I just want to say congratulations on this, and, and I wish, Beth, that we could duplicate you all over the state, because you are a driving force in this, and you are a driving force in delivering health care to our populations that need that access. So thank you, thank you for what you're doing in, in Northwest Indiana. Thank you for being here. Uh, this is a little bit off topic, but maybe not because in your slides you say follow the trauma, you know, crisis intervention, uh, because I really like this model. I'm just curious, have you focused any services uh, in helping uh, victims of violent crime and homicides, and those families? I've read about a program in Alabama, a really innovative program where they get into those homes within the first 48 hours of people who've suffered from from uh, murder and other violent crimes are, you know, those crimes are on the rise in Indiana. This is a really interesting model. One of the things that we're doing now is we are funding some of our police departments to add social workers. And so we've um, funded a total of four. Um, so uh, part of that is, number one, it started with overdoses, clients who are out there who are they're constantly called on. And so with that, it's kind of morphed into also dealing with when there's su um, homicides, suicides, the victims. And so it's kind of been like a social worker slash victim advocate role. So they go right in there, they're there with the individuals through time. So um, like I said, I, I love this program and I think the opportunities are available and what I always tell the providers we deal with is dream, what do we need to do? How can we figure out a way to do it? So it's an ex excellent model. Any further questions? Well, thank you so much for being here. And Mimi and Kara are going to join um, our next presenter, Lauren Savitkas, uh, to talk about how um, overdose death cases um, are being used to inform um, it, prevention strategies in Porter County. Uh, so Lauren serves as the Suicide Overdose Fatality Review Program Manager at the Indiana Department of Health. And uh, prior to a Q&A session with the HealthLink team, uh, Lauren's going to give a brief overview of the state's overdose fatality review teams. Lauren? All right, thank you everyone. Thank you, Doug, for inviting me to share a little bit about the program that I do at the Indiana State Department of Health. Uh, my name is Lauren Savitskis. I am the Suicide and Overdose Fatality Review Program Manager. So here's our agenda today. Um, I'm just going to give you a brief 101 about what the program is, what's the point of the program, how does this look in Indiana. Um, I want to show you one brief example of what you can learn from a team from their data and recommendations. And then I really want to just ask some questions of our local OFR team uh, program coordinators that are here today, just so you can get a feel for what they're learning um, from the ground level. So we know that drug overdoses are the leading cause of death in the United States, and we also know that just throwing pasta at the wall and hoping it sticks is really only good for pasta making. So we're taking these ideas and we're looking at what really works at the ground level, because how do you prevent something without understanding the community landscape? So we actually take the public health approach um, to violence and injury prevention when we're looking at these overdose fatality review teams. We start out with defining the problem, who, what, when, where, why. Then we look at identifying risk and protective factors because it's not enough to know the baseline demographics. We really have to do a deep dive into the understanding of what is, are the protective factors that are available at the community and state level, but also what are those risk factors. 
events. Once we um, identify those, we move on to developing and testing prevention strategies to better intervene um, and prevent future overdose and suicide deaths. Once we do some test prevention strategies, if it works, we assure some widespread adoption of those policies, procedures, and programs. So I call it OFR, SOFR, that's the acronym that we use. It stands for Suicide and Overdose Fatality Review. The purpose of an OFR team is to effectively identify systems gaps and innovative community-specific overdose prevention and intervention strategies. In practice, OFR or SOFR involve a series of confidential individual death reviews by a multidisciplinary team. These death reviews, also sometimes called a case review, examines a decedent's lifestyle. Um, we are trying to facilitate a deeper understanding through this process to look at missed opportunities for prevention and intervention that may prevent future deaths. So during a review team meeting, um, if you, they're meeting at a table or in a Zoom room, depending on what their uh, COVID policies and procedures are, uh, individuals sit around these tables and look at all of the different information around an individual's life that shows the different interventions and possible touch points that occurred from birth to death. So the records that are shared can include death certificate information, the death investigation, DCS reports, treatment opportunities, criminal justice engagement, any interactions they had with peer support. The list goes on and on, you know, mental health, treatment, all of those, um, and to really inform the team of what happened through an individual's life cycle. Um, this also would inclu include any uh, social history or life stressors. So once the case is reviewed by the team, the question is put out there, how could have this death been preventable? Um, and then the teams go through and they brainstorm what they wish they had from a policy standpoint, from a legislative standpoint, um, education and training opportunities, programs, harm reduction, modifications of anything that currently exists to better address mental health and substance use um, and that trauma that was discussed previously um, that they learned from during the OFR case. So now I'm going to talk to you about what uh, the program in Indiana looks like. The Overdose Fatality Review Pro Program is a best practice nationwide. We are very fortunate to have this program in our state. Not every state has it. Not every community has it. And so um, it's all set up a little bit differently across the country. So I just wanted to tell you what it looks like here in Indiana specifically. So in Indiana, we at the state, or myself really, uh, helps to coordinate the local sites. You can see on the map, um, in blue, all of the communities that have an established suicide and overdose fatality review team. The light blue counties are uh, those that are considering or have been in talks with me or the state about bringing this program to their community. So we have about 20-ish sites um, that are doing this program. It's, we have a state-level database that local sites have access to. We actually input the data from the teams for them, so that won't be a barrier for them to you know, dedicate their time into entering that data. So we at the state ha uh, house the REDCap data system that we put the data that we learned from the teams in that system. We do have legislation that started July 1st of 2020. Um, it allows for the team to share this information. As I mentioned, this case review is a confidential process. So everything that is shared during case review has to stay in that room. But we do have the protection of legislation to share those different report sources and records to better understand what happened during an individual's life course. Um, we do include suicides and overdoses. The teams get to decide what types of case they review. So they can review, review a suicide by any manner. They can also review overdose deaths. Um, they, it just varies by county by county what they're able to look at. Um, we look at both upstream and downstream prevention strategies, so we're trying to figure out what we can do you know, at that time of death, but also way back into childhood to address uh, early um, adverse childhood experiences. Um, and then we're increasing the conversations around social determinants of health. I would like to point out that some of our teams do receive funding from um, the uh, Division of Trauma and Injury Prevention at the State Department of Health through their Indiana CARES um, ECHO grant, so they do have some of the teams have some dollars to actually address some of the prevention initiatives that they put forward. Fatality review in principle is not a uh, way to place blame on any agencies or the individual who has died from an overdose or suicide death. We are not pointing any fingers. We are not a peer review. Um, we're really just trying to better identify the gaps um, in the system so that we can learn from these deaths and prevent future um, fatalities or even non-fatal events. So that's all well and good, but what does that mean really? 
Um, so we have a team in Clark County that was established in March of 2020. Um, they are a joint team with their child fatality review team and they have been meeting every month virtually since March of 2020 to review these overdose and suicide cases. They select their cases um, through random selection. They also, they send out a list of names and then if there are existing known touch points, they prioritize those cases because there'll be more content to discuss. Um, but they do, because of the number of cases that their community sees, they do theirs uh, through random selection. And then uh, here is what they found. So they reviewed 36 cases and generated over 178 recommendations based on what they had learned from their case review. Um, that sounds like a lot. Um, so what I do on the back end is every time someone makes a recommendation, I write it down, I put it in an Excel spreadsheet, and then I group it by theme. So that's what you're seeing on your screen here is what was the theme behind the recommendation. So um, as you can see, uh, healthcare recommendations made up 14% of their total recommendations, followed by social determinants of health recommendations at 11%, and tied for third was that primary prevention and follow-up um, into care at 9%. And just to give you an idea of what a uh, social determinant of, of health recommendation from Clark was, was they wanted to improve the affordable housing and recovery housing in their community, coupled with education to the general public in Clark County to help destigmatize and bring that conversation forward around the need for um, a more affordable housing and recovery housing in their community. So everybody loves data, so I pulled some data for you too. Um, so knowing that the Clark County's uh, so, uh, overdose fatality review team had many recommendations around healthcare, I pulled some of the corresponding data associated with the theme of healthcare. So um, what you're seeing, what that graph is, is of the decedents reviewed, only four had no known healthcare touch, po touch points 12 months prior to death. Um, in the 12 months prior to death of the decedents reviewed, 77.8% were seen in the ER. 8.3% um, were seen by EMS, 13.9% uh, were hospitalized, um, and 27.8% were seen by primary care. Um, so to put that into more numbers for you, um, in the 12 months prior to death, 28 individuals utilized their ER, 10 individuals accessed it just one time, while one individual actually accessed the ER on 10 separate occasions. Uh, the average individual went to the ER about 2.6 times. So eight of those visits were for non-fatal overdoses, and actually 14 days prior to death, five individuals were actually seen in the ER. So when you hear that number, you say, okay, what did they think of that? So the Clark County team actually generated a lot of recommendations around healthcare, and I'm not gonna read this <laughs> list to you all. I believe you all can, can do that if you are interested in, but one of the things that kept coming up over again, over again was that there needs to be a better involvement of behavioral health in the hospital setting, regardless of medical complexity. So regardless of what is coming in, they need to do a better job of triaging and involving mental health in that care um, system. They also um, wanted to increase the access to M MAT induction in the ER. That is a program that they have, but it is not utilized every time, and they thought that that would be something that would have better served the clients that unfortunately had died from later future overdose deaths. Um, and then also better suicide and mental health screening in the ER um, system. So now I have come up with some questions for the representatives here. Um, as, they, as Karen Mimi mentioned, they are a part of, I think Kara sits on five of the OFR teams up in the northern part of the state. Um, and then Albert is from Lake County. And I just wanted you all to hear from them what they thought of the program. I think it's great, but I wanted them to share some of their experiences with you all. So I'm just gonna ask them some questions um, and then we'll turn it over to you all if you have questions for me or for them. So. Um, We'll just get started. Uh, tell us a little bit about your fatality review program. Um, so I think Mimi alluded to this in our, our previous presentation. It kind of came up um, outside of everything else with a conversation in the corner in Littleport County. Um, and so Mimi was like, all right, let's do it. Let's start one up. And so I'm starting to do the research on it. And I come across more and oh, wow, the state has this wonderful program going already. And I reached out to her, I want to say she emailed me two minutes later, and um, we just like kicked it off from there. Uh, we got LaPorte County set up, we're like, oh, this is great, is there one in Porter County? We got Porter County set up, oh, this is great, we should do Lake County next. Um, and 
I think because of the system work we'd already been doing, there was already a really natural overlay to all of the partners that we wanted to become engaged. And because of all of the groundwork that Lauren had done, um, from the state perspective, we had a roadmap for everything we needed to do. So frankly, it was actually quite easy to get going um, because of all of those, those components. So I mean, we see a lot of the same folks at our OFR meetings that are at a lot of our other meetings. Um, but because it has such a singular focus, there's not a lot of repetition. And, but you're able to take those insights. And I think it, it kind of shifts your the kind of paradigm about how you think about things, especially from the system perspective that you can take into all of those other meetings, that you can take into the other collaboration work about, oh, this is a, this is a, a thing that we've recognized ha has happened over and over again. And, and you kind of take those insights into the other work that you're doing as well. Um, and so I, I think I'm speaking a little bit more generally, because as Lauren said, I do sit on, on five of the teams <laughs> all in, in Northwest Indiana there. Um, but Albert, uh, I don't think we've introduced Albert. He was our, um, our last minute ad. We were able to get him from his very, very busy schedule. Um, but he's our facilitator for the Lake County team and is just absolutely exceptional. Do you want to kind of speak to your process as you got started? Sure. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you all for allowing me to speak. Thanks. Uh, I think I'm in the best and most privileged position here, sitting between <laughs> Mimi, Lauren, and Kara, uh, who have all been great mentors. Uh, so here in Lake County, uh, Mimi called me up one day and she asked me would I be uh, considered uh, doing the facilitation for this OFR. And so I'm from prevention. My background is public health and prevention. And so I'm interested. And she ends up telling me about it. And immediately I go, this is a need. And so since that time, uh, Lauren was able to train me in how to facilitate, what were the things to do, uh, how to allow the group to come up with the recommendations uh, as we're listing the cases, and to be ever mindful that we're not dealing with, with uh, just uh, cases where people, quote unquote, abuse drugs, we're dealing with real lives. And so as a result of that, we have set a tone in Lake County that we are people first, uh, we talk about people who are suffering from substance use disorder, uh, and that could be someone just as easily suffering from a medical illness. And we don't, we don't uh, quantify them by what they're suffering from, but actually, let's look back, uh, back through their past and see what they've experienced. And one of the things in, in our Lake County that we are finding is that as we are being more inclusive of people, as we're reaching out to bring more pe people to be a part of our team, uh, so has also come people with lived experiences. And I got to say that the biggest eye opener has come when the conversation shifts from just us from a uh, organizational standpoint or systems thinking to what it was like from people who actually lived those experiences and were able to hear and uncover so much detail that it allows us to go not down rabbit holes, but really uncover the deep reasons for why people are using substances in the first place, which links back to the prevention as well as the trauma. And I'll say in Lake County, as we are finding, and I'm sure it's all over, but the addressing of trauma should definitely be a part of not just one of our systems, as in mental health, but in all of our systems, to find out not what was wrong with people, but what happened to people. So that's us in Lake County. <laughs> and I just want to say, it really, the way the meetings run, it personalizes it. Because you see a picture, you see a name, you see their history. You get a sense of what's, what happened. Yeah. Um, it's fascinating. Um, you get, because we have DCS sitting there. We have law enforcement there. We have the coroner there. We have community mental health. And you get a story of a person's life. And you see it's lost lives. And it helps us in terms of the work that we do and what we can look for in the future to help prevent future overdoses. But you really, um, it's a very sobering experience and um, it's not for the faint-hearted, um, but it's a very touching experience. And um, if you've never attended one, I would suggest you at least experience it because you really get to know the person. It's not just a male dive but you see their lives, their interests, their stories, mm -hmm. and you see the trauma that they've experienced. Mm -hmm. We've had cases, it's just amazing, of 
the childhood trauma that they've experienced and how people have been able to roll out what's happened to them. So it's, it's, it's a very, I think, I, I, it makes it kind of come full circle. You say I'm passionate about it, but it really does, and it gets you to see it from a different place. Mm -hmm. And so it helps you and motivates you as you go forward. Um, so what have you learned from your overdose fatality review teams that you've actually been able to implement and take out into the field? I think one of the biggest uh, first things that we were able to really identify was in our LaPorte County team. Um, we, as we've shared, are a federally qualified health center and we have dental providers um, embedded in uh, a, a number of our clinics. So in LaPorte County, I think we're actually one of the very few um, dental providers that accept Medicaid. And so what has come across as we're doing these reviews, um, in LaPorte County, like none of the others, almost a startling majority of, of the decedents that we review, we have seen for dental, and not just dental, emergency dental. Um, they're coming in to get teeth pulled with abscesses, with broken teeth, um, all of these different types of things. And um, so then that became really alarming to me of like, okay, well, what are we doing here? So, and especially a lot of the cases when we reviewed them, they, they didn't have any other touch points. They didn't have any of the traditional touch points. They hadn't engaged in treatment or care. They didn't have criminal justice involvement. They didn't have DCS involvement. And kind of like we heard from Maddie or, or Doug shared earlier, these people are that, that are just kind of skating through that aren't, we're not reaching. But they're, when your teeth hurt, your teeth hurt. You can't, you can't do anything else about it. And so... Um, how can we capitalize on that? So we, uh, Mimi and I reached out to our chief dental officer. We kind of explained this to him. We talked to him about what we were seeing. And he was like, well, I have an all-staff meeting for all dental staff on Thursday. Do you guys want to present? <laughs> and so um, Mimi put together a presentation on, you know, what the presentation for substance use disorder might look, in, look like in dental and um, expert techniques for screening um, brief intervention and referrals to treatment how you can approach those types of conversations, kind of the importance of it. And I actually did a few case reviews with them, like using their own encounter notes of the cases that we ended up knowing were decedents that we had reviewed in our OFR meeting, um, just sharing their own case notes to say, you know, you guys saw these people in person. And one of the dentists even said to me after I recognized one of those notes was mine. And it was very sobering for them to say, like, you know, you know, they knew at the time in a lot of the cases that this is probably a person that's struggling with substance use disorder. But as it, from the dental profession, they don't get the vocabulary or the tools on, on how to address or engage with that. Um, and so we got really great feedback from that. And then we actually were able to leverage our peer recovery coaches, went out to each clinic individually um, and did some role playing sessions and further conversation um, with all of the dental staff on on just practicing having those conversations, on practicing um, kind of bringing that up. And so again, all of this came out of, we saw a, we saw a pattern and how, how can we kind of immediately act on that? And I think that was one of the cooler things that um, we were able to see. And you know, there's been quite a few other cases as well where I'll see, especially when there are patients, it's like, oh, what are we doing about follow-up for missed appointments for MAT? Or um, how can we, enhance our screening process here? Or can we add more PHQ-9 or depression screenings when XYZ is the situation? Um, so especially internally, we're able to leverage a bit, especially as a community as well. Um, you know, we've started planning a, 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 a provider training event for Lake County. You know, there's all kinds of stuff. Um, Albert, do you want to speak to anything that? Sure. Uh, knowledge is power. And one of the <laughs> things that we picked up on was that there was uh, those who were experiencing it and had passed from overdoses was that many of them belonged to the field of manual labor. Mm -hmm. So construction workers, truck drivers, uh, people that are, are using their bodies in ways repetitively that's causing injury, and that injury is, is having symptoms of pain, and then that seems to be a journey or entrance into the substance use and addiction. And so one of the things as we're walking away with that is, OK, how can we uh, let the, the industry know, those companies that are in Lake County and, and hopefully throughout, ways in which they can inform their workers and their employees about opportunities to get treatment as well as what are some of the warning signs and symptoms 
of when you are in need of, of treatment and not just go out and then look for pain pills that could lead to an addiction. So that's one of the areas we were, we were awakened to. Um, and then what do you want this commission to know about the, your overdose fatality review teams? Are there any barriers, challenges, or highlights that you really want to share with them? Yeah. Uh, I definitely have something. So <laughs> Lauren told us that she's collecting all of this data. And this data that she's collecting in, in Lake County is also being fused with the data she's collecting throughout other areas that have these OFR teams. And so it is such a privilege to know that that data can go and not just transform our Lake County, but our state as we are hearing these same patterns resonating from other communities. And so as what I would like to know is, as, as you all are able to see this data, please allow people and representatives from those communities to also add voice to that data so that we can see how we can make a whole system that will make Indiana shine and how we deal with recovery and treatment so that we can avoid the senseless and needless deaths that have been occurring. Um, I would just add that I, I feel like the OFR team participation is one of the more meaningful things that I do in my job. Um, what we're able to take out of it, even just individually as a organization for our own patients, much less the community at large and the systems that are operating within the community, the value is so high. And, and we're getting insights and information and, and connection there that's not happening anywhere else. And it, because we're able to share all of our records, it's such a unique environment that, again, you can't do anywhere else. Um, that I think it's also, those relationships are growing there. And again, in a way that we're not seeing in any other type of group. You know, a lot of these same people are convening in a lot of different things that have been convening in a lot of different things. But something is clicking different in these meetings. Um, and the collaboration is growing in these meetings. And people are working together. And, and there will be things where something will come up. And someone from this organization will be like, oh, I have that resource. Call me after. Can you stay on the line? We, need, we can talk about this. So we can get this sorted out. Um, and all of these things are happening in real time. So I guess just for you guys to know that this is kind of, if you guys didn't know already about this, that this is kind of a, a, a secret superstar that is growing <laughs> in this county that under Lauren stewardship has just, yeah. I think there's a lot to leverage here and a lot of capacity to grow to make that map all 92 counties. Yes. Um, you're going to get so much insight because it's, one county is not the same as the other. Each county is different. We're getting different insights. We're seeing different patterns. We're getting different connections. And so I can't even imagine how different our stuff in Northwest Indiana is from Southern Indiana, from Eastern, Western, all of that. So that would be my, my piece is just this, there's something big here, I think. And I, I think that this is something that um, if your county is not doing it, I would recommend you really look into it mm -hmm. because it gives you so, such a different perspective. And as we're all here fighting this epidemic, this is a different way to do it. And it's the information you get from this will really help you design programs to address this. And it's not, it's different. And like I said, because you're hearing what has happened and what could we have done to prevent this. And so as we have our continuum of care, this is a piece that needs to be plucked in there and that I think people to, need to invest more time into it. And if your community doesn't have it, look to having it. Mm -hmm. We were able to get some counties who had tried to do this before and couldn't get it done. And we didn't have to work that hard to get it done. And we got the right people at the table. We got the prosecutors at the table. We got the DCS directors at the table. We got the community mental health centers at the table. And we and the coroner. And the coroner was actually the hardest person to get because they're so busy. But we got them to attend. And then law enforcement just um, joined. And so and in some of our counties, we have multiple law enforcement oh, yeah. there at the table and um, and they love it yeah you know, they love it and because it's a, again it yeah. gets them to see what can we do yeah. not what just has happened what can we do so um, that's my plea for this <laughs> <laughs> consider it and if you're not doing it really look at it mm -hmm. or at least sit in one and you learn a lot 
Well, thank you. Questions for the group? Senator Yoder? Well, that was a great leading question. My question is for the group. Yes. Well, that was a great leading question. My question was, well, that was a great leading question. My question was, how does a county get started? Who do we approach? Uh, and that's, so that's one question. My other question is, how does the, SO, the OFR map correspond with the heat map that we were given? H how are those talking? Because I was just looking at some of the, the polls that we have and what legislatively, is there anything we can do to help get this in all 92 counties? Three questions, really. Yeah. Sorry. I'll start. I'll yeah. kick us off. Um, so you, to start a team, um, uh, you all just need to get a, in, a hold of me. Um, so uh, we, I am at the State Health Department, um, and I help the local communities establish these teams, whether that's from data entry, facilitation, um, case selection. We have a roadmap to follow, so it's not just... Um, you know, just start a team and do it. We have training guides and infographics, one-pagers, all that information, um, so they can just get a hold of me. I sit in the Fatality Review and Prevention Division at the Department of Health, um, and essentially just, yeah, that's how you would start a team. Or I work with that. Counties can do this on their own, um, but when I started four years ago, there wasn't a clear roadmap, and I'd rather the counties be able to use the resources that we've created for them um, to get started. So that's how they start a team. And how does the OFR program, the, the teams that are being formed or currently up and running, how does that uh, overlay with the heat map that we have uh, through FFSA with where we're seeing uh, the greatest activity? Sure. Yeah, so the overdose fatality review program is a, uh, counties may participate in that. They are not required to participate in that. Um, I think that is key because buy-in is so essential to these teams. We're talking about people's lives. So we want to make sure that the people who are coming to the table have a vested interest in discussing prevention opportunities. Um, I actually just saw the map for the first time today, but Maddie and I have had conversations behind the scenes on how does this work better together because we don't want to be siloed. And so how do we include her teams in the review process? Um, how do they communicate information? So. Um, it's, a, it's a continuously being built out and we are having those conversations to make sure that they're included. Um, I think the teams uh, probably have a, a pretty significant overlap with where those new harm reduction teams are for the overdose fatality review, uh, just because they are the more high burden areas in the state. And, and Senator Yoder, I'll also add, um, the legislature uh, this last session allowed for some data sharing, which changed the, the way that these teams were able to interact in their meetings. Um, before everybody sort of showed up, um, uh, and so the the law then uh, opened that up, and now there's all, they can have open discussions around the case. Um, and I think if you look at the map, um, what a lot of these maps that we have, what they really correspond to is where we have really strong local leadership on these issues. Um, you know, if you look at Northwest Indiana, Allen, Allen County, Howard County, um, Clark and Floyd, uh, even um, Bartholomew. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> really small. Um, uh, th these are areas where we have a lot of other programming going on. Communities that are engaged in this work, um, this isn't the only thing they're doing, uh, and they, they see the benefit in it. And so I think it, the maps more correspond to where we have really strong local well, I would say that I have great leadership in Monroe County. <laughs> um, I'm going to sort of stand up and fight for them. Um, they have, we have great leadership. Uh, and so I'm glad that um, I'm sort of looking ahead. Like legislatively, what can we do? What more can we do? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to say that um, Lauren is doing an excellent job. And I'm so glad that you're working with your team. I would say, Lauren, you are a team of one. <laughs> One and, for, a half. <laughs> one and a half for overdose fatality review. We suffer with the same issue with child fatality review for the state of Indiana, maternal mortality review, which is done uh, through a large grant that we got. These are funded through very small grants. And the way to get this and start with the communities that need it first is to support Lauren and her team to be able to be there to go out and actually start to work with individuals within the communities and develop these programs so that we can, at the State Department of Health, 
share our, our resources that we have developed, our, our information, our technical assistance. That's really what we should be there for. And even help them to get that data put into a data bank like the Red Cap so that we can look as a state and see not just Clark County data, but data for the entire state. Any further questions? Well, thank you, and um, thank you to all our presenters. Uh, I finally just want to mention um, that since September 2020, uh, the Indiana Department of Health and our partner at Overdose Lifeline uh, have distributed 70,000 naloxone kits statewide. Uh, you know, that translates into 70,000 potential lives that can be saved, saved through naloxone, and that's a significant increase uh, over previous years. Um, and, and that's really due to the lingering impacts of COVID and the fentanyl um, that we're seeing. So I appreciate everyone's time and attention today. Our uh, next meeting is Friday, February 4th. Uh, it'll be at 10 a.m. in this room. Uh, we'll send out more details, and we'll also send out the list for next year's meeting uh, to the commission. So thank you for joining us, and we stand adjourned.